All right, guys, I'm going to record this fast because at, at current time of recording, I've got to leave in like eight minutes. This is Runeterra's top 10 most annoying cards and how to deal with them. Basically, we took a bit of our own personal opinions as well as a Twitter poll that I recently put out. And uh, basically, Precipic and I put together a list of the top 10 most annoying cards in Runeterra and tips for how to better counter them or play around them. At the end of this video, I'm going to be giving you guys two really, really big tips that are going to help you guys get to Masters a lot easier. That will, you'll kind of like see these as recurring themes in the topics on this video as well. All right, at number 10, we have Make It Rain. Make It Rain is kind of the Bilgewater anti-aggro card, and this is an incredibly powerful card that you'll see in basically every Bilgewater deck. It does a great job at slamming a board full of one health units so the tip here is to not overcommit one health units in the super early game when you're thinking like you know turn two and turn three of the game as the aggressor you're really often not going to want to play multiple one health units if you can avoid it and when you get into the later rounds it's very important to try to put a little bit of a buffer playing multiple uh, higher health units before playing you know even extended copies of one health units if you're playing Demacia you should be auto keeping Rangers resolve against bilge water decks in general because because that happens to be a very, very good counter. So keep make uh, Rangers Resolve even if, even if the rest of your hands doesn't necessarily support it. You do need it against Bilgewater. It's just a little bit too good because it also stops stuff like Twisted Fate Red Card. Lastly, you're really gonna want to be aware of the keg because a lot of Bilgewater decks will try to combo make it rain with a Powder Keg, right, to deal two damage to everything instead of one. So if you see a board where that kind of looks like it might be getting value, try to make sure you are saving a response. Save both mana as a response as well as a way to potentially deal with the powder keg on the stack to deny the doubled up make it rain value. I'm going to give you guys one last tip for make it rain, and this is going to apply to all fast speed or burst speed spells in general, which is that, you know, the way you want to think about these kinds of cards, especially the ones that kind of deal with the board, is that they really punish you for not developing into your attacks, right? So in Runeterra, we have this idea of, you know, do I develop into my attack, which is play units or maybe some kinds of spells before my attack make my attack a bit better at the risk of giving my opponents blockers or do I attack right away so that they don't get to develop anything denying myself options but denying them options too open attacking is a very powerful move and a lot of people realize that if you develop into a turn you do open yourself up to punishment by the opponent playing big slow speed stuff but what a lot of people don't actually realize is that by open attacking, you are getting punished by fast speed stuff. That's the entire idea, right? When you are taking these aggressive open attacks, you are giving more value to this identity of like fast speed mana that controls the board. So a lot of people against Make It Rain might actually be open attacking a little bit too much. And instead, what you might want to be doing is start your turn with developing unit that stays alive for Make It Rain. Maybe commit to developing more cards if you can, if there's nothing that's pressuring you in the matchup to open attack. Let's play into the board a little bit so the Make It Rain gets worse, because when we open attack, we are feeding these cards value. The reason for that is because it's all about which player gets to have spent more of their mana on the attack, right? If I'm denying myself my mana on my attack, but you have a fast card, you get to play your mana, and I'm at a mana disadvantage for the combat. Keep that in mind. Number nine. So this is Aurelian Soul as well as general, kind of like all the Invoke cards all at once. Um, I would say something that we're planning is to do a more extensive like how to beat type segment where we'll go into each episode like a different way of like, oh, how do I beat this deck or how do I beat this card or how do I beat this archetype? Ways to play around it, ways to counter it. And honestly, we're going to have to do a full one on Targon as well as like this Invoke package. But just to like cover the quick tips here, a really big thing, the single biggest thing with the idea idea of these invoke cards is they basically all give you slow speed stuff right when you invoke when you're getting like a powerful effect it's giving you this idea you know all the big spells are slow right and there's a couple of burst speed options but those are ones that don't in, uh, impact the board themselves and instead just give you slow speed cards like Living Legends, uh, Moon Silver, and Written and the Stars all just end up giving you slow speed cards or the mana discount. Um, so everything off of the invokes is at slow speed, which means one of the biggest things to counter these is when you're kind of like trying to kill them before turn 10, which you have to do against the Reliance All. You cannot take this champion into the late game. You are the aggressor here. You are going to have to commit to a lot of open attacks, which means, you know, starting 
your action on your attack turn with an attack. What this is going to mean is not just like, oh, let's jam the attack in. You have to plan around your open attacks. You have to set up for them. When you're on your defensive turn, every single time you need to be thinking to yourself, okay, am I open attacking next turn? Pro maybe yes. And if yes, I have to set up for it. I have to make my actions this turn in a way that gets that open attack the most value possible. Now, a really big thing in Legends of Runeterra is just planning out your turns, right? Now, you always have to be aware that against an Aurelian Soul deck, they're going to drop Aurelian Soul on turn 10. So we do need to be planning on closing the game. Uh, not necessarily always before 10. Sometimes you can kill them on turn 10 or 11, but certainly not after 11. Uh, you could, in specific deck archetypes, have a way to try to like deal with the Aurelian Soul, like Vile Feast Vengeance, if you're playing a War Mother's Control style deck. But for the most part right now, your goal is to be trying to win earlier than turn 10. A really big thing with that is that you just have to be setting up your entire game. Your, enti your mentality starting like turn 5, turn 6 should be to set up for the kill. So think, you know, okay, I'm attacking on evens or odds. All right. I've got three more attacks left to kill the game. Okay. I've got two more attacks left to win the game. And in doing so, you're going to be able to kind of like plan ahead and leverage your tools so that you can get maximum value. Don't try to be too hasty. If you try to go too fast, you will probably run out of steam and lose. And if you try to go too slow, then you, well, I mean, their ace hall is going to come out, it's going to flip, and that's going to be a really big issue. So just make sure you are under, like, exactly understand what your clock is, what the turn you have to kill them is. Don't try to kill them really before that turn. I mean, you can apply pressure. Pressure is great, but don't overcommit on everything to kill them before that turn. And, like, you just have to plan around a specific timing and you'll do a lot better. Lastly, with all these invoke cards, you just really want to be aware of, you know, what to play around and what the pool is, right? So especially depending on, you know, which of these cards are going to be invoking, you're going to want to make sure you play around different options. For example, Spacey Sketcher, the one mana card, will only invoke cards on this pool here. These eight cards is what it's going to see. And you want to be watching to see what the Spacey Sketcher plays. If they play Spacey Sketcher kind of early and then they don't play, you know, any of the cards that it could have given them for a couple of turns, you want to be really wary of cards like Crescent Strike, and even sometimes cards like Equinox, depending on the deck that you're playing. Think about what their card could be and make sure you play around it a little bit. Sometimes predicting that they grab the Crescent Strike will make the difference between playing around with this double stun or not, which can absolutely be game deciding. Next up, we've got Solari Priestess, um, which drags from the four to six mana range, right? So a lot of the cases, what this entails is playing around these two cards, Meteor Shower and Fallen Comet. Make sure to try not to play into these cards' big value. So you get a lot out of, out of playing around with those invokes in particular. And then sometimes the uh, like double obliterate one from Supernova is probably the biggest play around from the big invoke. That's going to be the seven plus mana invoke from Star Shaping or Aurelian Soul, which only like other late game decks really have to deal with. But if you play around those big cards in particular uh, off of those invokes, you'll get a lot more leverage in your games. A really big thing is just the fact that they're a lot more predictable than I think they seem. A lot of people will see invoke as like a very random concept. And of course it's RNG, but like if they don't play their card right away, you usually have very good information on what they could have and ways to play around that that I see a lot of new players not tapping into. And, uh, and yeah, to, uh, to actually no one surprise whatsoever, uh, turns out I was unable to record this entire video in eight minutes. All right, uh, next up, number seven. So number seven is Fiora. That's number eight. Number eight is... <laughs> number eight, Fiora. Okay, so... Fiora is a very powerful card. Fiora's biggest threat is that she can represent an alternative win condition to win the game. And we're, right now we're seeing a really big resurgence of Fiora Shen. Fiora Shen is actually a really great deck right now. And the biggest problem with Fiora is that Fiora Shen, a deck like Fiora Shen will threaten to win the game just with like Demacia value units while simultaneously forcing you to deal with their Fiora. And usually if it's just one or the other, it's not really a big deal. But the problem with Fiora is she threatens 
friends both. The first trick you're going to want to do against Fiora is to identify very early on in the game if you think the Fiora is going to be kind of like your main problem in that game. Now, one way to do it is obviously, you know, just seeing how fast she gets the first two kills. That's a really big deal. Um, but a really, really important one is gauging the opponent's aggression early. If they play Fiora on three and they don't really have much other forms of aggression, you're really going to want to focus on Fiora as the primary win condition for them, the biggest threat, especially if they've been banking mana on either turn one or turn two to leave open flexible options like Rangers Resolve, like Barriers. So it's at that point that you want to be thinking, okay, we're going to have to start playing around, uh, playing around Fiora and saving tools for her. The best counters for Fiora are keeping uh, things that can very cheaply and very efficiently pop any barrier effects that get applied to her. So these would be cards uh, that deal one damage for a small amount of mana at fast speed, like for example, Vile Feast, like for example, Unspeakable Horror, and of course, you know, the premium Make It Rain, which we actually just talked about. There's a lot of cards that can like pop barrier very freely, but a really big thing is in these matchups, don't use them that early, depending on, you know, whether you need to or not. Don't feel baited and make sure you're keeping the tool in hand if you think the Fiora win condition is going to be a major threat. There's a lot of great ways to like, you know, reset Fiora and make sure that she's not going to be a threat entirely. One single reset basically offsets her for the entire game. So good way of doing that are stuff like you know will of ionia if you use it on her will completely reset her ability um and hush is also really great because it stops stuff like barriers and it also um is able to effectively stop her from getting a kill for a turn now when fiora is on the board you're gonna need to play around multiple other cards in the opponent's hand a lot of the things on this list i'm basically you know making sure that you guys are aware you're playing around from an early position you need to plan around them a couple of turns in advance fiora is the most unique because when she's on the board you have to play around specific other things from hand uh, the biggest problem cards are single combat and concerted strike so making sure that you keep spells up to basically stop these from going off on the Fiora is going to be absolutely critical to your game plan. A lot of it just comes down to awareness and just making sure you know what you need to play around, saving the tools as well as the mana from an early position to do that. Now, Fiora Shen decks do one thing, and here's the biggest tip of them all, which is very, very telegraphed. And now that you know this, like when you hear this, you'll not be able to not see it, which is think about it. You've got this idea I've talked about earlier, this idea of open attacking versus, you know, developing into your attack, right? And that's always a problem you have to face. One of the reasons to develop is if you have challenger units uh, or units that gain value when they attack, which the deck runs a lot of. But run, one of the reasons to open attack is if you have a lot of spells, a lot of combat checks. That deck has nothing but those two. So if you're against the Fiora, Shek, uh, Fiora Shen or just like honestly any Fiora style deck, really, what that means is whenever they declare their attack, you can pretty much always be sure that they have combat tricks to spend their remaining mana on. So if they play, you know, a, if, if they play, like, for example, a three or four mana unit and they bank like two mana and they attack, they're likely going to have access to like a range resolve or a single combat or something like that. If they open attack, you can basically always assume they will have combat tricks to be able like expensive ones, potentially like concerted strike, like repost maybe, or multiple combat tricks because they are making sure they're banking maximum into their attack. When that deck has other things like challengers and like Shen, depending on the version you're playing that it might've done before it's open attack instead, right? Uh, so just always be sure to gauge exactly how much mana they have left because they're usually telegraphing, they're representing really hard exactly what their tools are to counter you. All right, number seven, actually number seven. We've got Gen, huh? Genevieve, Gen, Genevieve, Gen. Got it. We've got Genevieve Elmhart. All right. Genevieve Elmhart is obviously kind of like the powerhouse Demacian finisher. It's like the ultimate card for what Demacia wants to do. You'll see it three of top ended in something like Scouts. And this card is a really massive threat. So what are the ways we're going to deal with this? Because this is how you really just lose the Scouts, right? Well, the first step is to try to keep their board narrow. When you're against Demacia, Demacia is all about these wide board buffs, right? They want their they want to just maintain board presence. They are pure mid-range right? So what that means is, you know, you've got stuff like Vanguard Bannerman, stuff like Genevieve Elmhart, stuff like Ranger's Resolve, right? So many things scale with the amount of units you have on the board and just try to like maintain having a lot of units on the board. 
So when you're against the Masia, not even just, just for the sake of Genevieve, but this also really helped against Genevieve, try to keep their board as narrow as possible. Make some plays that you slightly might not make otherwise to just like reduce their unit count. Nothing like too crazy, um, but just like, you know, I'll, I'll often be taking a very aggressive stuff like Thermo Beams, for example, against the Masia, just to make sure they don't get any additional value out of these cards, right? Keep their board narrow. Now, the single biggest thing about Genevieve specifically is as long as you have an answer in your hand to shut down her attack, you're actually often going to be able to at least survive that turn and potentially recover the board, right? Depending on, obviously, the game might look in a lot of different ways by that point in time. But what this means is you really have to keep your tools in mind. Do not waste tools. I see so many people misplaying this matchup because they had a way to have stopped Genevieve later on in hand. I'm sorry, my dog is playing with a toy right now. It, they had a way to stop Genevieve earlier in their hand that they kind of wasted or didn't really didn't really use her full value. And because of that, they end up having no way to stop Genevieve when she actually gets played, right? Really good examples. Okay, I can't stop her from playing. Really good examples of this are stuff like Arachnoid Sentry, Ice Veil Archer. I'm going to go ahead and show these Ar Arachnoid Sentry. Arachnoid Sentry, right? Placed on an enemy. Or Ice Veil Archer. Uh, the ability to just, like, stop an entire attack because she has the Scout Challenger, so she has her own really strong double uh, Challenger attack that you need to stop. And a really, really common one is Spacey Sketcher because Spacey Sketcher, as we mentioned before, has the ability to pull Crescent Strike, which I, I guess I can only show from here. Crescent Strike, right? So what I see a lot of people do against Demacia, prob probably mistakenly so, is that they'll play Spacey Sketcher a little too early and maybe get baited into picking something other than Crescent Strike. Crescent Strike is just so perfect against Demacia and against Genevieve in general. It really shuts down so much of their game plan. But I see a lot of people like play their Spacey Sketcher super early. Spacey Sketcher is absolutely not meant to be, uh, it's, it's not meant to be a tempo card at, mm -hmm. Spacey. It's not meant to be a tempo card at all. It's meant to be more of like a mulligan card. You can play it turn one if you need a blocker, but you shouldn't really be playing this too aggressively. Otherwise, you really want to get more information before you make the decision off of this, right? And there might be some weird matchups where against Demacia, you know, maybe you'll favor from a Spacey Sketcher pulling, um, you know, the Serpent. The Serpent's good against Demacia, right? Don't get me wrong. Remember what I said. You counter Demacia by keeping their units off their board. Serpent does that. But, you know, you can't really pick the Serpent unless you have an answer to Genevieve later, right? So look at your hand. If you've got a way to deal with Genevieve, then, yeah, you can space the Sketcher into Serpent and keep their board low. That kind of thing is perfectly fine. But save an answer for Genevieve. Concussive Palm. Uh, I can't possibly have spelled that one wrong. I still have this filter on. Concussive Palm is a very common answer to Genevieve, right? Anything that stuns, anything that can... Even, like, Thermo Beam is all right. You can use this a bit aggressively sometimes. It really depends on your hands. But just, like, whatever you need to do to maintain... Even if it's not a great answer, if it just stops her from going super crazy, uh, it's going to do a lot against the Genevieve turn, right? Sunburst can be all right as well. All right, next up, we've got Riptide Rex. This is number six. Riptide Rex. So Riptide Rex is a super, super scary finisher to games. Bilgewater is a great region right now, and pretty much, uh, you know, half the Bilgewater decks in the game are going to be finishing with this bad boy. You just slap this baby on the board on turn eight. They always have it. I've never once seen a Bilgewater player not have Riptide Rex on turn eight. Don't think it's ever happened. And... You know, you, you obviously usually following it up with warning shots so that you can just tr trigger it immediately without really having to deal with the condition. Um, so, Riptide Rex, a really good way to, you know, just play around it is, and, you know, I say this about all things, but just make sure you are prepared for it, right? So, starting turn six, maybe even turn five, just be aware that it is going to come down in a few turns. So what that means, sometimes if you're an aggressive deck, you can try to end the game before that, try to like accelerate your clock, right? Um, and that can be fine. But a really big one is making sure you're taking exchanges in uh, ways that depending on the matchup, depending on your Nexus health, if you can keep your units like slightly alive, um, you know, favor going wide on a board when you're approaching these late turns. When it's like turn six, turn seven, 
these are like probably after they've played their make it rains and their red cards so at that point against bilgewater you want to have a bunch of weak units on your board right normally bilgewater really punishes you for playing these one health units but it's really like right before the rex comes down where you want to block in ways that you're maybe keeping your units alive at one health even if it's maybe less favorable for other reasons so that rex doesn't do as much damage to the board or just having a board full of like fairly beefy units that you'll often have access uh, to as an option right so a really big one of uh versus reptide rexes and you'll see this again on this list in every known category which is you know always plan about whether you're going to open attack or develop into your attack turn right if you're attacking on turn eight or nine think about whether you need to develop right always assume okay if i play a card before my attack my opponent will probably play rex am i okay with that if not I might just have to attack, right? And it might feel a little bit bad, but there might not be another choice. Now I'm gonna add one final caveat to this, which is always, always first, before you do that, ask yourself, can I beat a Riptide Rex hand even if I play around it, right? Even if I open attack and I play around the Rex, it, let's assume I'm not killing him. If he then plays Rex after my attack, am I still screwed? If no, and this is really important, if no, we are forced to assume he does not have it because that's the only reality in which our decision would have an impact on anything at all. So we're forced to assume we live in that reality where Rex isn't in his hand, right? And this applies to a lot of things on the list. There's some situations where you're the aggro player where you will be forced to assume they don't have make it rain and you will be forced to play into it because you'll think about it and you'll realize, play it out in your head a little bit and realize, well, if he has a make it rain, even if I play around it, I probably can't win. Maybe I'll play into it. Make it rain, I didn't mention it with that card because usually make it rain happens in like turn two, turn three, turn four of the game before you've really seen, before you really know if you have to go all in, if you have to take a risk, right? But you can't always play around Rex. Sometimes a lot of the value of cards like Reptide Rex is like forcing you into being paranoid, forcing you to feel like you have to play a certain way and they can gain value passively just by being in the hand uh, or in the deck, even if they're not in the hand, right? So just ask yourself if you can even beat it by playing around it. And if not, you have to assume they don't have it. Number five, we've got the Infinite Mind Splitter. The Infinite Mind Splitter is a super powerful card ran in all versions of like Targon ramp, like uh, Kuvira's Asol Targon style deck actually plays Mind Splitter really, really uh, a ton. And that deck, you're probably gonna see a bit on ladder because he won a tournament with it pretty recently. And they specifically, it is basically a Mind Splitter control deck, right? Mind Splitter control deck is what we call it. And the idea is we tutor out for Mind Splitter with Dragon's Clutch. Uh, we go for it really, really aggressively. Make sure we always have it on turn eight and we always have it on turn nine. It's not just one Mind Splitter, it's two Mind Splitters, baby. And we're just gonna stop everything. We're gonna shut down the entire board and make sure you don't get to play any of your things. So what do you do about Mind Splitter? Well, the single biggest thing about Mind Splitter is just making sure that you aren't getting too baited into taking open attacks that aren't amazing for you. Here's what happens. Usually, if you're a tempo deck or not even necessarily an aggressive deck, but if you're the deck who kind of has to win faster than Targon, which is most decks because most decks have to win faster than Targon because of ASOL, a lot of people feel like they, you know, they are good to open attack on turn eight, right? And if they miss their clock on turn eight after an open attack and the infinite mind splitter comes down post combat, the game is pretty much over at that point. It's really, really hard to get around them. You did an open attack that often denied and locked out so much of your mana. You got to think about open attacking like that. You're locking out both players mana, right? That's not necessarily what you always want to be doing. Sometimes depending on your opponent's deck and their options, you need to spend your mana so that you're not locking out theirs. Because what a lot of decks like that will do is if they're under threat of dying, they'll star shaping if, to survive that turn. And then they'll mind splitter on nine and then you won't get your attack on 10 anyway. Or they'll let the attack happen and then mind splitter knowing that they can just star shaping on nine and it's the same thing, right? So here's what you're gonna wanna do. You're gonna wanna develop, right? If you're the tempo deck, and you can't always do this, it really does depend on the hand. You got to think about what they might have. But Mind Splitter gains so much value off of people feeling like, oh God, I got to open attack, right? So if you have a couple of plays to make, if you play like 
two or three medium or small size units because this is going to be turn eight you're going to have you know your last attack you're going to have a bunch of options in hand sometimes mind splitter isn't really doing much because what it represents as a card is just one unit in a big body that doesn't affect the board on that turn which is terrible if you can threaten them that turn right you can make it really difficult for them to play mind splitter and in doing so sometimes just win out on games that you know your opponent didn't have the ability to stay alive if you just played your cards now if you're watching this closely and paying attention this is where you're going to point out a real big issue which is hey swim but if you said earlier that aurelian saul uh the way you counter a lot of invoke cards is by maybe aggressively taking those open attacks and therein lies the rub. So you're going to have to really think about how many invoke cards has he played? What am I scared of him? What does he have the mana for left? Because sometimes maybe you'll play, maybe you play one card on turn eight and then they play something cheap like uh, Solari Priestess, right? And then you're thinking, ooh, do I develop further? Maybe I should just attack now. Think about what they could have, right? Think about how many cards has he invoked all games? Right? Am I going to get punished by, you know, some of the big invoke punishing cards? Or can I just safely develop wide in a way that will get around Mind Splitter, right? So you, it is always comes down exactly to what you are most worried about and what's more likely to be coming from their hand. Now, what if you're maybe a slower deck that can't burst them down and you actually just need to stop this effect from happening, right? Well, depending on the kind of deck you're playing, there's a lot of answers. Uh, I've actually teched in multiple wills into my Lee Sin deck that immediately counters Mind Splitter super, super well. And a very common one you're going to want to go for is if you're also playing Targon, you're going to want to think about Equinox. Spacey Sketcher, and I said I kind of like hinted at this before, I can't stress enough, Spacey Sketcher is not only one of the strongest cards in the game, but the most misused. People play it early, people aren't planning ahead. So not only do they play it early, but they're also not planning ahead. So I'll see people like play Spacey Sketcher on turn one and choose like Charger or the Messenger or like which doesn't really make sense. The messenger is good, but you don't yet know if that's the one you even want to be taking, right? So just try to play a bit more reactive on your spacey sketcher and make sure you're actually helping the situation you want. Equinox is a great counter to Mind Splitter in a lot of like kind of slower mirror style games. Lastly, it's going to feel kind of bad, but there's going to be a lot of situations where you are going to be, you know, really late into the game. Um, oops. <laughs> forgetting this tag you're gonna be late into the game your board's gonna be full mind splitters kind of already come down already stunned two of your units and you're gonna have to override your stunned units to play more units and that's gonna feel bad but whenever you're faced with the opportunity to do that you should pretty much always do it you do need to have like if you want to close out the game you're gonna need all your units for the attack every attack counts you can't just have like units that are being fat kitted on on the bench on the sidelines when you want to be attacking so you gotta override them yourself kill them so that you can actually get the attack you need also a bit of a bit of a pro tip if you do have silences if you have something like hush well you can't hush the you can't hush the mind splitter right but you might be able to hush your stunned units just to allow yourself to open attack or block or something there is a chance of that being able to be the thing that uh, makes a difference and closes out the game Okay, next up we got Leona. I'm realizing now that this video that I was intending to be like fairly quick is actually going on for a really long while. I apologize for that. Uh, I'm trying to be kind of like thorough with these these tips and like how to actually play around them. Honestly, like I couldn't really keep this kind of video short because like it, in order to really help you guys, I actually need to go a bit in depth about, you know, how to really be thinking about these and, and ways to approach it. Anyway, number four, we've got Leona. So Leona is a very powerful card. You'll see her in a ton of Targon decks. And honestly, to talk about her, I need to break her into a couple of different parts. So part one is like how to play around Leona when Leona's not on the board. Well, if she's not on the board, you should kind of expect her to come down. So if you're trying to play the aggressor against Targon, you're going to want to be considering taking some open attacks on turn, you know, four, five or six, just depending on if you have a good attack, right? Don't take an open attack if you know, you're not made, but if your attack's already sweet and you don't want to give yourself a chance of ruining it, just go for it. Don't give them an opportunity to play Leona and stun while developing a blocker in one action. It's just not worth it because that's the number one thing you have to consider whenever you're thinking about developing versus open attacking. Because, you know, I can talk all day about playing around things. You know, you always want to be thinking, oh, am I more worried about their slow speed things or their fast speed things, right? But at the end of the day, you can only really open attack if you're on pace to win the game by doing so, right? If your attack isn't really good to win by the clock you need to win, 
you can't really be taking open attacks and you're forced to develop and then Leona might get a stun and that's okay. You'll have to live with that if that happens. But I do see a lot of players that have a good advantage throw that advantage away completely by developing into a Leona and giving her just like absolutely huge anti-aggro value right just stopping an entire attack because of that next there's the leveled up leona and this is kind of like where you're really going to have to play around with the fact that she's probably going to be getting off another stun per turn right and usually when this happens you don't really have the ability to close out the game by open attacking sometimes you can and you just hope that they don't have you know um star shaping and at that point you know, maybe that's the only thing you can do, but in a lot of cases, what I like doing on these turns, and this depends a little bit on how they play, is I like developing into them with, like, multiple units while saving a big unit to play later in hand. The biggest thing about Leona is that she stuns the strongest enemy, right? So, depending on your hand state, sometimes you don't need to open attack. Sometimes, if you have, like, a big thing to play that will make your attack a lot bigger, a lot bigger, but you can play a small thing first to bait out either the Leona from hand or the level the leona stun daybreak trigger you really should be doing that so that's my tip about leona whether you're thinking they might have her in hand or whether you're worried about leona stunning from the board which is this idea of okay you 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 often will have to open attack but if you have a really great development to add to your attack to like for example like a pretty big unit these are usually going to be in the turns um kind of like six seven eight mana turns right a really big unit to make your attack uh do a lot more and actually punch for more value like i don't know screeching dragon just like any anything that you might have um or genevieve or something like there's a there's a lot of games where you might actually do something with rex in this which is a little bit funny um but if you waste an action playing something small first usually a small unit and then if they don't really get a good stun then you play the big thing afterward and they're kind of screwed off of that right the way that her stun works is that it goes by strongest which is calculated by highest power and then highest health and then highest cost okay this is deny number three is deny everyone's favorite card deny has actually been a card that's been around for a while i don't think it's you know it's a fairly overrated card in terms of its power level it is a good card it's a card that's plenty competitive and depending on that we're actually seeing leeson pretty much auto include three denies right because that's like an all-in deck that really needs to be built around that many denies for the most part ione decks that run deny most ione decks don't even run deny some of them run like one deny um and it's something that you can play around in a pretty specific way now, mostly Deny should only be on your mind when you're playing against, like, Karma or Lee Sin. But in those cases, Deny should definitely be on your mind. Um, you're going to have to think about it from an earlier turn. Sometimes there's some spells, like, for example, you know, Decimate, Relentless Pursuit, that you might end up playing a little bit earlier than you normally would just because you have a unique situation to play it when they don't have mana for deny right it costs four mana so you really want to be abusing this from early turns right make sure that anything in your hand that's maybe an expensive deniable spell not even expensive could be something like noxian fervor could be anything right any sort of like to spell that you don't want to let them deny think about using it when they don't have mana to deny because when you think about it like this you know they're only gonna have they can deny a lot of cards anytime between turn four and turn eight but there's a lot of cards that you actually don't mind playing a little earlier, and it's kind of impossible for them to keep up four mana all the way from turn four to turn eight, right? So you can often sneak in a window if you're thinking about it proactively. You're thinking ahead. You're like, I might not get another opportunity to play this under deny mana. Let's. I would normally play this other thing, but let's play this under deny mana while I can. And as always, yeah, just give them opportunities to spend mana. Give them opportunities to tap under mana. Deny is not necessarily often used in combat, although it sometimes is perfectly plenty of the time is and it should be thought of because it's a fast way to use your mana for value in many cases it ends up being another example of a card that ends up punishing open attacking so you know developing into them giving them an opportunity to maybe tap under deny or maybe punishing them for having a hand that has deny maybe they don't have as much likelihood towards having ways of actually proactively playing mana when you're developing into them maybe they have less options for units to block or spells to actually practically do anything don't be too hasty to open attack if you're worried about you know these kinds of decks all right next up denies big brother hush 
So Hush is a card that's, it's a little bit tricky to list on this list just because there's not a ton we can do about it, but there are a few things and it is a card that a lot of people find annoying, so we did have to list it here. So how do we beat Hush? Well, there's a lot of strategies that don't have amazing options against it, um, but there's still usually little things you can do uh, to help a lot, right? A really big thing about Hush is that it is the kind of like ultimate flexible card, right? This is the thing about Hush that makes it so powerful. I think, so, you know, if you're watching this video, hopefully you're you're really thinking about mana and this idea of being mana efficient and this idea of fast cards versus slow cards. This is why in Legends of Runeterra, like fast plus speed spells are so expensive compared to other games because they have the innate ability to lock the opponent out of their mana for that turn, which is crazy. Other card games don't have that because the combat system in other card games is different. When I open attack with a fast or a burst option and my opponent doesn't have one, then I locked out their mana for that entire turn. You, they still have the mana, but they don't get it for that attack, which is huge. That's absolutely gigantic. When the opponent has to has to open attack with their action because they're afraid of my slow speed option, I just turn around and you know play my fast speed option and force them to feel bad because I just locked away their entire mana for that round. This is why Hush is so good because it's kind of the ultimate flexible card. Because combat, the flow in of actions in Runeterra is all about getting more mana than the other guy, right? You want to be safe. If the opponent open attacks and you've got like nine mana, they're locking it all away. But Hush is a nice flexible card because it gets to choose how much mana it is, right? Even if your secondary Hushes aren't great, they have the ability to allow me to use, at least for some value, my six mana or my nine mana on the open attack, right? So, the biggest way to deal with Hush is to take those developments. Now, you're not going to brick it entirely, but usually if your board is pretty Hushable, especially if they're thinking about multiple units, and you're developing, if you're playing units, making sure you're making your attack step bigger, they will have to represent the Hush. You know, there'll be a point where they'll pass back to you and you'll be like, okay, they probably have Hush. And that way, A, you'll know it's coming, but B you're punishing it. You are getting value out of your attack. Because when Hush punishes you the most is when not only does it shut down your board, but it baits you into open attacking as well, right? Here's the bit of an issue with Hush, which is, again, against Targon, you're not always able to do this because Targon has a lot of ways to punish open attacks. At the end of the day, I probably should have just named this video like how to think about open attacking versus open developing because that's so much of the logic in this is just weighing the odds, thinking about, okay, what am I more scared of from a probability perspective of them having it? And what am I more scared of from like, even like how much of a threat it is, right? And just weighing those and deciding what you want to play around. Other than that, the single biggest thing you can do is just like, make sure you have an option to at least keep your stuff alive, right? Uh, there's a lot of cases where if they hush your unit, as long as you can keep it alive, you can still win the game, you know, a turn or two later when it's unsilenced, right? So don't be taking super risky attacks with cards like Ezreal uh, or like buffed units that need to stay alive. If the Hush plus block would kill your unit, be very careful of that. Sometimes what this will mean is not taking an attack altogether that you might have otherwise taken. And I'll do this sometimes with like, like elusive style decks or something like that. Maybe you don't want to attack too early uh, with stuff that will just kill your elusives. Wait until you can at least protect them from Hush. That can be uh, a way to play around it. And number one on this list is Radiant Guardian. Radiant Guardian is a Demacian powerhouse. You're seeing it in basically every form of like mid range or even like a ton of like basically control decks. You might even uh, call many of them that are just super slow playing. And what they'll do is they'll just drop this on turn five. And because it is so insanely efficient at dealing with aggressive strategies, a lot of aggro decks will just fold on the spot to this. And that can be really, really nasty. So what do you do about Radiant Guardian? Well, be very, very careful if they are attacking on turn five. Any Demacia deck that is not straight up MF Scouts, you should assume they have Radiant Guardian, right? So what that's going to mean is when they're attacking on, if they open attack on turn five, they want to be playing Radiant Guardian after that, right? Uh, it's very interesting. If we're thinking about this game as a, you know, think about the idea of a fast versus a slow card as not just the speed of the card, but whether it punishes open attacks or rewards open attacks, right? 
So this is a really important framework because Radiant Guardian is a slow speed card. It's a unit, it's a blocker, but in reality, what it really usually represents is actually the opposite. It's actually usually, its role as a card is an open attack punisher for the opponent and an open attack incentivizer for the player. So when I'm sitting on Radiant Guardian in my hand, I want to open attack because then I spend my mana post combat and I get my Radiant Guardian because something has died. Or when, you know, I'm the aggressor and I open attack, I've then you're going to block and then you play Radiant Guardian and I'm screwed, right? So this is a slow speed card, but do not think, do not categorize it in any way at the, at, in the same way as other slow speed cards, okay? This really is a fast speed card, unless you're dying that action, but it's not really about that. It's about whether it punishes or rewards slash incentivizes open attacking, right? Radiant Guardian rewards. So what that means is you treat this like a burst or a fast speed spell. Play around it like that. When you're on turn five, if you're thinking about open attacking, maybe instead play a card, develop into them. That means if they want to Radiant that turn, they won't be able to play a blocker. They'll have to pass. And then you get maybe a second attacker. And then suddenly your attack is looking real good. And your pass is looking real good too. Because some decks, maybe, you know, you've played a second unit. Now they really want a Radiant, they'll pass again. And at that point you could attack. You've got a great attack, a much better attack than you just had before you played those two units. But you can also just pass and burn their mana. There's a lot of decks that maybe you're not in a hurry to kill them. You just burn their mana and punish them for holding their mana. And this is how Radiant Guardian wins games. By making you guys think that this is a slow speed unit. This is not a slow speed unit. This is an open attack punisher in every sense of the word. Now, with Radiant Guardian, you also really want to be aware. Just keep in mind this card, right? Don't forget about it. I have this thing. I play around a lot of things. I'm very good at playing around stuff. But if you watch my stream, you know that I literally always forget about Radiant Guardian. I have some mental block that just prevents me from remembering that this card exists. So the opponent will open attack on five and I'll just block like a donkey and just trade it down. And then they'll Radiant Guardian and I'll Poro into concede. Uh, it's very weird. Don't do that. Okay. All right. Um, and then the final tip. Oh, oh no, no, no. B before, before I hang on. Wait, wait. I wanted to mention that with Radiant Guardian, Decimate works the same way, by the way. And this is actually why Decimate is a good card. A lot of people think Decimate is a slow speed card. It is super, super not. There's almost nothing about this card that's slow speed, except for the fact that it's slow speed. There's only, there's like one situation in the entire game where it actually matters that this card is slow speed. What Decimate is, is a card that wants to be played post combat, which means you want, to, when you're holding Decimate, it allows you to open attack because then you can just spend your mana on the Decimate after combat. That's great, right? And this is why out of all the slow speed spells in the game, Decimate is one of, is one of the few that's actually even ever been viable, right? Because it doesn't want to be played at slow speed, right? You, you play it in the same way you would a fast speed spell, which is, you know, after combat because how decimate works because it doesn't impact the board after combat and during combat end up being the same thing anyway the final tip about rating guardian and honestly pre like pre preventing this from happening in the first place preventing the lifesteal and tough for value in the first place is like most of it but if they get the guardian off and then if you, if you have if you're staring down a lifesteal tough rating guardian how do i deal with it then well a really helpful tip is uh when you block when you declare a blocker and then sacrifice your unit on the same action they won't go to combat their unit won't go to combat and they won't get the lifesteal so you can do this if you're playing an aggressive deck with some cards like noxie and fervor um when they attack with a rating guardian you can like block and then sacrifice your blocker if it dies there, the Radiant Guardian doesn't get to lifesteal off that combat. It doesn't get to attack at all, which is really great. You can also do it with cards like Glimpse Beyond, anything that sacrifices a unit, sometimes even intentionally killing your own unit with a card like Mystic Shot to do so. Anyway, that's it. That is my top 10 most annoying cards and how to play around them. Uh, I really enjoyed doing this kind of thing, like having like a kind of like Twitter poll about your guys' most annoying cards. I'd love to do this kind of thing more often. Let me know if you guys have any ideas. Honestly, I'm not just doing that like YouTuber engagement thing where it's like oh oh yes oh put up the comment section give me ideas no no, no i'm actually desperate i'm all out of <laughs> i actually i actually do need more ideas <laughs> so let, let, let me know if you guys have uh, have any ideas for these kinds of things that you'd like to see me do or uh you know any sort of uh poll type stuff or help play around with certain things I, I think it's very fun and hopefully it'll be very helpful to a lot of you guys anyway that's it for me and i'll see you guys next time